we'll speak today. Thank you. Yes, sure. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm B.B. Sun, a sessional lecturer in JCU Singapore, and I would like to wish all the women a happy International Women's Day. So welcome to our talk today, and our talk is going to be delivered by Yong Ding Li. Yong Ding Li uh, uh, carried out his PhD research in conservation and ecology at, an Australian, at the Australian National University. He currently works at BirdLife International Asia Division as a regional coordinator for his work on migratory bird conservation and overseas project in several Asian countries. Ding Li is especially interested in Asian ecosystem, the ecology of migratory species, and how regional cooperation can strengthen their conservation. He has written several papers and books on biodiversity conservation and birds in Asia. So with that, I'm happy uh, to let Ding Li take over the floor. Uh, so it's all your Stingley, I look forward to hear from you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Thank you very much, BB. Um, my name is Ding Li, and it's really a pleasure for me to join um, your session today, uh, calling in from Singapore. Um, ironically, I'm just about to head out to Australia for a work meeting for in the next few days. So um, timing is actually quite good um, because it makes me think about all these uh, issues about migratory birds. Um, just a little uh, bit of introduction and thanks again to BB for providing a bit of background about the work I do. I'm uh, I'm based at BirdLife International's regional office here in Singapore. We work uh, widely across Asia and for me I work specifically on projects that are related to the conservation of wetlands and migratory birds. Um, so um, I, I, I hope that the presentation I'm, I'm about to deliver uh, will give members of this uh, floor here uh, a little more insight about um, the issues that we are facing uh, with regards to migratory bird and wetland conservation in the Asia Pacific region. Um, I know that several members, uh, several um, members of the audience in this talk are probably keen bird watchers or are involved in, in some way or others on wetland conservation. So I will not bore you too much with the background. So uh, I'll probably run through qu quite a few slides on the background on this flyway and then go straight into some of the um, issues and emerging understanding of some of these um, threats that are faced by migratory species in Asia. So um, I think this uh, first slide hopefully gives you a little um, overview uh, of what I hope to cover. Uh, talk a little bit about the birds in this flyway. So hopefully this will be interesting for the bird watchers and the ornithologists amongst uh, the floor. I'll visit briefly uh, the, the topic of habitat and migratory species connectivity. Um, I'll probably spend a bit of time talking about the threats. Uh, some of these threats are very familiar issues for migratory bird conservationists in the region, but a lot of these threats are not that well understood and a lot of recent work has shed quite a bit of new light on the scale of some of these threats. Um, I will then go on and look into uh, migratory birds from a conservation dimension. So I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of mechanisms and instruments that we have uh, that we can mobilize to protect species. And uh, finally, I will do a little bit of uh, selling of our bird life um, activities and initiatives. Some of the things that we are trying to do uh, to protect migratory birds in this corner of the world. Um, I think just to give the um, the audience a little bit of background. Um, I think we can take a look at a very familiar migratory species here in Australia. Uh, for those of you who are bird watchers, you probably know the, uh, quite a bit about the migration of the bar-tailed godwit. Uh, this is a very regular occurring migratory shorebird that you can see in many of these coastal wetlands in Australia. And it is obviously a very impressive migrant. Um, recent work on the migration strategy of this species by many researchers working in Asia, in North America, has uh, found quite a lot of new information about the bar tail godwits migration. And uh, it's a really incredible journey these birds take every year. Um, it is a non-stop migration of more than 10,000 kilometers moving through huge swaths of the Pacific Ocean from their 
wintering grounds to their breeding grounds and then from their breeding grounds back to the wintering grounds each season so migratory birds are are amazing groups of creatures they they really um um continue to fascinate us with their migration uh and a lot of uh uh, new work is beginning, only beginning to shed light on some of these impressive migrations these um, these shorebirds are, are, are taking across the Asia Pacific region. So uh, a little bit of background on bird migration for those of us who are interested in ornithology. Um, uh, a lot of birds around the world are considered by ornithologists as migratory species and depending on who you talk to, uh, many people estimate that up to 40 to 50 percent of the known bird species around the world are migratory to, to some extent. Uh, most migrations uh, undertaken by migratory birds are latitudinal, so they move from north to south or in the case of Australia and New Zealand, they move from south to north in response to seasonal changes in, in temperature and rainfall. Um, in Asia, obviously, many species uh, breed in um, Eurasia, in Russia and China, and many of these species are long distance latitudinal migrants moving uh, up and down the Asian continent uh, with the seasons. Um, obviously, um, amongst the ornithologists, amongst us, um, there are many different strategies for bird migration. Uh, but of course, for the context of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about species that perform these long distance latitudinal migra migration, um, and especially species that breed in Asia and North America and migrating to Southeast Asia and the Australasian uh, uh, region. Uh, again, a bit of context building for those of us who are uh, perhaps new to um, understanding the life cycles and ecology of migratory species. Uh, when we talk about migratory species, we typically think about the places where these birds breed. So specifically the breeding grounds. Uh, we also think a lot about where these birds go to uh, during the, their non-breeding season. So these are the wintering grounds for many of these species. These are the places where they spend um, in the tropics or even in the southern hemisphere in Australia and New Zealand. But of course, we cannot forget about the places that they move in between uh, from where they are breeding to where they spend the northern winter. And uh, this is what many biologists consider the uh, stopover or staging areas. Um, there are many of these wetlands across the Asia Pacific air, uh, region, which are considered to be important stopover and staging areas. And these wetland sites are obviously very important to the life cycle of these migratory birds because these are the landscapes, these are the places where these birds would spend considerable amounts of time to rest and refuel before they proceed on their migrations, um, whether towards their breeding grounds or towards their wintering grounds. So um, when we talk about the life cycle of migratory birds, we typically refer to the different parts of this, um, this, this um, life cycle with reference to their breeding areas, their wintering areas, and the places which they stop over in between. Um, migration is obviously a, a very big and interesting area in ornithology, and there's, have, there's been lots of work to you know, look and understand migration in and around the world. Uh, obviously, a lot of that work has been done um, in Europe and North America, um, less so for Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific region in general. But of course, this has changed quite a bit in recent decades. There has been a, you know, a big increase in interest in migratory bird studies. And uh, for those of you out there who are interested in migration, you're probably aware that um, quite a lot of work has been done by Australia based researchers or even Japan based researchers to track the migration of many of these birds. Um, our, our attempts to understand the migration of birds has also changed with the emergence of new technologies. So in the past, I think uh, we've got a lot of these large and clunky pieces of technology um, which weigh a lot uh, and which means that the kinds of birds that you can study on their migrations have to be fairly large size for them to carry uh, those transmitting devices on their bodies. But I think one of the, the big changes um, in the last decade or two is that uh, we are beginning to see more and more, more of these small size transmitters, which means that we are now able to track many of these migratory birds that are far smaller than those we did 10, 20 years ago. So um, with the emergence of new technology, including technologies like um, light level geolocators and other uh, kinds of small sized transmitters, um, biologists have been able to understand some of the um, 
migratory patterns of small species like thrushes or even things that are smaller than thrushes, things that weigh within the range of 50 to 100 grams. And of course, this will change again in the next 10 to 20 years where even smaller pieces of equipment are out there for us to track the migration of these birds. Um, so um, we, are go we are living through really interesting times for people interested in bird migration because the kinds of technology that's available for us to study bird migration have changed and evolved so quickly in the last um, 10 years or so. Um, coming back to, to Asia and just to give uh, people who are not familiar with Asian ecosystems a bit of broad geographical context. Uh, Asia is obviously a very important continent for migratory birds um, as a breeding ground, as wintering ground, and of course as stopover uh, areas as we have seen in my previous slide. Uh, about 600 species of migratory birds use the Asian continent on their migrations um, back and forth from the temperate zone and the boreal zone towards the tropics. Um, based on what we know so far, approximately 60% of these migratory species are co considered as long distance migrants. So they travel considerably large distances of more than a thousand kilometers as they move from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. And uh, given the, the length and breadth of the Asian continent, obviously Asia overlaps with many migratory uh, systems around the world. Uh, for those of us who study migratory flyways, Asia overlap with at least three major flyways globally. Uh, right here in the Asia Pacific region, many of us are familiar with what we call the East Asian Australasian Flyway a very important um, migratory corridor used by 500 over species of birds between Asia, Southeast Asia and Australia. But of course, that's not all. If you look at Asia more broadly and looking towards the western part of the region, uh, there are also other very important migratory bird systems such as the Central Asian Flyway. Um, and of course, connecting Western Asia with Africa, we've got the Afro-Eurasian Flyway um, that is relatively well studied because so many of these um, biologists are based in Europe. Um, the, the really important thing for us to take note of, about bird migration in the Asia Pacific region is that uh, the, the, through these migratory birds, they are moving in between different parts of the continent. Uh, these birds are effectively connecting many, if not most of the different kinds of ecosystems we have here on Asia. So if you look at the life cycles of some of these thrushes or some of these shorebirds or some of these um, large water birds, these species are effectively connecting the boreal, the Arctic ecosystem systems of northern Eurasia with the temperate with the warmer temperate ecosystems of East Asia especially in China and Korea uh, and of course with the tropical equatorial ecosystems we have here in Southeast Asia um, especially here where I am living at the tip of the Malay Peninsula in Singapore uh, these are mostly tropical systems and uh, migratory birds amazingly connect all these different and diverse ecosystems across the Asian continent um, I know I've touched on this a little uh, briefly uh, earlier on, um, but just to recap on the East Asian Australasian Flyway, it's a massive flyway as you can see on this map. It covers uh, large swaths of the Eastern Hemisphere and connects two continents, uh, Asia and Australasia, uh, of course, including Australia. Uh, New Zealand and several of the Western Pacific Islands, um, effectively making this the largest migratory bird corridor on the planet. Um, um, at the same time, and of course, when you pay attention to the countries that are distributed across this flyway, this flyway is also effectively the most uh, populated, the most crowded flyways, because after all, many of the big countries with huge human populations are here in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and depending on who you talk to, uh, this flyway connects um, ecosystems of 22 countries, if not more. Um, so, um, but at, at that said, I also want to emphasize that um, this is definitely not the best studied of the world's migratory bird flyways. Um, this is a flyway that is diverse, um, that there's not much um, international cooperation on migratory bird research and conservation until recent years. Um, there's not that much work done on migratory birds, again, until the last couple of decades. So um, effectively, the East Asian Australian Flyway is also amongst the least studied, the least known of the world's migratory flyways. Um, one particular part of this flyway that uh, we talk a lot about in the conservation world is the Yellow Sea um, and Bohai Bay. Uh, this is a very important part of the flyway because if you can look at the geographical uh, 
location of this region that I'm talking about. This is smack right in the middle of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And um, common sense will tell us that many of the species that are, that are migrating through the flyway have to spend time resting and refueling at, at this, pi this point in the flyway. So um, the Yellow Sea and the adjoining coastlines of Korea and China is obviously very important um, part of the East Asian Australasian Flyway by virtue of its geography um, as a major staging and stopover area for species traveling up and down the flyway. Um, many of the most threatened species that we have here on this flyway use these wetlands in the Yellow Sea. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with migratory birds, you will know that uh, some of the uh, most charismatic and threatened species in this flyway are uh, staged in the coastal areas of the Yellow Sea. The best known being the spoon-billed sandpiper, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, the second image that you can see in my picture, right in the middle, this is the Notman's green shank. This is also another highly threatened uh, shorebird that we have here in the East Asian Australasian flyway. So, um, uh, short point here is Yellow Sea is really important for bird migration. Um, I hope that few slides uh, have been able to give you a little bit of the geographical and bio biological context on, on uh, migratory birds in general and more specifically on the East Asian Australasian flyway and how important this flyway is to the conservation of migratory species in our part of the world. Um, I'll talk a little bit in my next few slides about the kinds of threats that we face in this in this flyway. Um, and of course, there are many different threats. I probably could spend a long time talking about each and every of these threats, but I'll pay attention to the two or three of the most important threats, um, some of which are better known and some of which are only beginning to be uh, uh, more studied in the, in the last few years. I think broadly speaking, uh, when we talk about threats in this flyway, one of the most important threat that migratory species are faced with is the loss of habitat. Um, if you remember me mentioning in my previous slide, I talk about how important this, well, how much uh, of the world population live within this flyway. So it, it is not surprising to see that we have so many um, pressures, you know, from humans on some of these um, existing areas of wetland habitat and forest habitat across the flyway. So, um, uh, habitat loss is obviously a very important threat um, and if you look at different parts of the coast of this region, um, the, the issue of land reclamation is a particularly pressing issue because um, as populations expand um, and increase all across Korea and China and Japan, uh, we find that the areas along the coast are often the areas that are most likely to be developed. Um, land reclamation has obviously taken up a large chunk of wetlands in coastal China and coastal Korea. And of, obviously with that, a lot of these uh, key areas of wetlands uh, have been irreversibly uh, lost. But on top of land reclamation, there are also other um, pressures on um, the use of um, the coastal uh, of coastal areas coming from infrastructure, from agriculture, uh, from aquaculture, not forgetting that this this part of the world consumes a lot of seafood. Aquaculture pressures are uh, amongst the biggest threats to coastal wetlands in this region. And of, of course, uh, more and more um, th the threats from expanding industries um, such as um, ports and refineries. Um, there's been obviously a lot of studies in recent years looking at loss of um, intertidal and wetland habitat on the coast. Um, some of you may be aware of these studies. Uh, some of these studies are done by colleagues at JCU, for example. Um, the work of people like Nick Murray, for example, has uh, uh, in recent years shed a lot of uh, new light on how fast coastal wetlands are being lost in the East Asian Australasian flyway region. I think this is a very important, a very landmark paper that uh, you, many of you may have read, um, looking at loss of intertidal flats all around the world and showing that uh, the region around East Asia, especially if you can see on the map here, all that region shaded in red, uh, these are areas where there are very high rates of intertidal wetland lost. Um, and then, of course, more recently, some of you may have seen this paper that um, Nick and his team has published, uh, looking at uh, losses and gains of tidal wetlands around the world. Uh, and again, intertidal flats get the spotlight because they are a, a, a system that are rapidly being lost and degraded all around this flyway.
So habit, habitat um, loss is, and degradation is obviously a very important threat um, to migratory species in this region. But of course, habitat loss is not all. Um, many migratory birds are faced by a whole bunch of other threats as well. And one of these threats that we are only beginning to understand in recent years is a threat coming from the wildlife threat. Uh, wildlife threat is um, a very big issue in Asia. Um, for those of you who have looked into the literature on wildlife threat, you know that um, countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, they are very large domestic traits um, due to a locally driven demand for songbirds uh, for the pet trade. But uh, recent work is also beginning to tell us that uh, besides the songbird trade, which has been fairly well documented, there's also a lot of uh, ongoing and illegal trade on um, birds of prey. Uh, I think there's a recent study uh, that has shown that there's a lot of birds of prey that have been trapped from the wild uh, across Russia and Mongolia. Uh, more recently, we are also looking uh, at domestic trade happening within uh, many Southeast Asian countries, and we are beginning to see that the scale of bird hunting is actually very large in many countries of Southeast Asia. Um, this is not obviously very known uh, to people living outside the region, uh, but if you look very carefully at countries such as Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, we know um, that there's a lot of trade uh, and trapping going on to supply a uh, wild bird meat for local markets. And this is uh, uh, an area of study that is only beginning to show how big the scale of this is. Um, recently, myself and a few colleagues, we were able to work um, across six or seven countries in Southeast Asia. And this project, we basically tried to um, understand um, what is the scale of uh, bird hunting happening at a domestic level in many of these Asian countries. And we found that, uh, especially in Vietnam and Laos, uh, millions, millions of birds, especially migratory species uh, like shorebirds, sandpipers, and even passerine birds like barn swallows are taken out of the wild every year to supply local demand um, for the, the meat trade. So um, this is an issue that is uh, something that we have only barely began to uncover and will be an issue that we'll be pay paying closer attention to in recent years. Um, not that long ago, there's also this very important study that was led by my colleague at UQ. Um, some of you may even know him personally, Eduardo and his colleagues um, uh, undertook a review trying to understand the extent of uh, shorebird hunting uh, and trade in the Asia Pacific region. And obviously he's found a lot of um, um, new issues um, and also reviewed the scale of how large um, shorebirds, the scale of shorebirds being hunted from the wild is in this region. So uh, all this put together tells us that um, hunting and trade is a very big threat to migratory birds in the East Asian Australasian flyway. Um, the scale of this is still not very well understood and I think hopefully in the next few years, we will be able to pinpoint um, where exactly are the, the priority areas that we should look into and uh, work with governments more closely to galvanize actions on the ground to address um, the issue of trade. Um, I won't have time to talk about climate change, but I think many of us in the in the in the floor here are aware that uh, besides habitat loss and um, the threat from bird hunting, there's also a lot of other broader threats coming from climate change, um, emerging um, uh, climate change patterns in the long long term is likely to change habitat conditions across the East Asian Australasian flyway region. And of course, these will add extra pressures um, to migratory bird populations already stressed by uh, threats of habitat loss and, and uh, hunting. Um, so not surprisingly, with all the threats that migratory species are facing across the, uh, the Asia Pacific region, uh, many species are in rapid decline. Um, Unfortunately, we do not have good long-term data sets from many different parts of the region, but at least for Australia, where there has been really good data sets for many species of shorebirds, uh, when these data sets were uh, analyzed, uh, we can see that uh, pretty much all the key shorebird species that we have in the flyway are in rapid decline um, across this part of the world. Uh, more recent work in Southeast Asia are also showing us that many of the commoner species of shorebirds are in decline. And I, I just want to briefly share uh, the example of this shorebird that is a really common species in Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia is obviously a data scarce region because um, there's very little long-term monitoring data available. But what we know about common species like even the, sh the Pacific 
golden plover is that uh, common species such as this have shown sustained declines um, uh, in recent years. So um, not good news in general. Uh, many species of migratory birds are in decline. And of course, the more we measure, the more we'll find out that species um, in this flyway are um, declining rapidly. Um, put together, I think um, our flyway here, the East Asian Australian flyway, is probably the most threatened of the world's migratory systems. Um, a couple of years ago, I tried to count how many species um, were listed as globally threatened. Um, and as of then, 61 species of migratory birds in this flyway were globally threatened. This number is, of course, a little bit outdated now because I think in the last couple of years, we've added a few more species to the list. So uh, again, for context purposes, uh, we can see that this flyway is really in peril um, thanks to the different threats that migratory species are faced with all across the region. Um, and of course, that is not all. Um, while I've addressed some of the threats that migratory species are facing, I think there are also broader um, scientific and institutional challenges that migratory species conservation is faced with. Um, I think for the case of Asia, one of the biggest challenges for us here working on the ground is that we still don't have access to a lot of data. Um, and we very much depend on what we know from uh, studies and long-term monitoring happening either in Australia, in New Zealand, or in Japan and Korea, uh, where else there's still huge data gaps across Southeast Asia and many different parts of China. Um, so obviously one of the biggest challenges for us um, in addressing um, challenge issues in migratory bird conservation is to um, address the, the scientific and evidence base, basically getting the science um, sorting out the science and making sure that we have, to, we have the numbers for us to, to, to make conservation decisions. There are also other broader challenges that we face at the legislation and policy level. Um, given the complexities of legislation in this region, um, maneuvering through the very complex policy landscape is another major challenge for us in tackling conservation issues. Um, and of course, more broadly, uh, getting local people to be engaged is a, a huge challenge because uh, the scale of the problem is very large and oftentimes we can only act at very local scales across the region. So getting local people aware, engaged um, and interested in migratory birds and their conservation in, is one of the big challenges that we face here in, in Asia. Um, and of course, um, coming back to my earlier point on get on the science and knowing where these important areas for migratory species are, uh, one of the big challenges um, that I should also talk about is that uh, we actually know a lot about where some of these most important sites are already. Uh, we have um, done a lot of work to identify priority areas for migratory birds. Uh, some of you who are familiar with the work of BirdLife know that uh, in the last 20 years, we have identified many of these important bird and biodiversity areas areas across the Asia Pacific region. Um, so basically, we, we pretty much know many of these important landscapes and coastscapes for migratory birds, but many of them are obviously still unprotected. And uh, uh, part of the challenge is to close the protection gap for many of these uh, important areas for birds across the region. Um, and of course, still on the point uh, on, on, on the evidence base, um, there is still a lot of work to be done to sort out what we know um, what we don't know about the, 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 migratory, the migratory journeys taken by many of these species. Um, there's this really important study that was written up a couple of years by one of my colleagues uh, looking at the migration of a familiar species to many of you in Australia. This is the great knot. And uh, uh, we thought we knew a lot about the migration of the great knot, but through the tracking work that was done uh, from birds that were captured in China and tracked across the Asia Pacific region, um, I think what was surprising for the researchers themselves, and of course to many of us in conservation, is that uh, many of these sites that are used by great knots are actually relatively unknown, uh, if not, um, not even um, captured by existing studies of migratory birds. So I think this this study, this example that I've pointed out here, um, again, is a timely reminder that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, to get the science right for migratory species. Uh, and of course, the Great Knot is not all. Um, more recently, many uh, Australian um, researchers have worked together to track the migration of Far Eastern curlews from Australia to East Asia. And um, again, the studies show that many of these spots that the, cur the curlews are using are not very well known, if not, not described at all. So um, looking back at the example of the Great Knot, 
work and the advice and curly work, we know that there's still a lot that we need to know, that we need to learn about the migrations of some of these 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 uh, species that we are trying to protect here in, in Asia. So um, now that we've gotten a little bit of context on the flyway and some of the key threats that species are facing, um, some of you may be wondering what are the actions that we need uh, to protect migratory species in this flyway? What are the next steps? I think if I have to summarize the next steps into a few um, into a few points, I think these would be the five or six points that I want to highlight to you. I think first and foremost, we need to get our priorities right um, because after all, we know that we cannot protect everything. Uh, we know that conservation resources are limited. So uh, this is obviously an area that conservation science has to step in to help us to figure out what are our priorities for conservation in this region. Um, so getting priorities right and getting the evidence based sorted out for migratory species, key areas of habitat across the flyway. Uh, at the legal level, at the policy level, I think there's still a lot of work that we need to do uh, to sort out gaps in legal protection for species. Uh, for those of us who are familiar with the legal uh, frameworks um, and, and policy landscape of many different Asian countries for protection of wetlands and migratory species, we know that there are still large gaps in these legal frameworks. Uh, if you look at the, the legislation of some of these countries we have here in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, many species of migratory birds are still not technically protected by national law. So uh, obviously one of the key priorities from the policy point of view is to look at these gaps and try to fill them as much as possible in the coming years. Um, another major area of work that we need to look into is making sure that we align our conservation and restoration uh, work um, so that to the, to the extent that they are able to reap benefits for local people. So we need to make sure that local people are engaged and involved and the work that we do to protect migratory birds are also able to generate um, gains for local communities. Uh, and this could happen at many levels and scales. And this could happen also through um, ecotourism, fisheries, sustainable agriculture, and, and a lot of different livelihood options for local people. So um, getting local people engaged is uh, obviously a very big part of migratory bird conservation in this region. Uh, but of course, to make sure that local people are engaged, we need to make sure that they're aware of migratory birds. We need to make sure that they're aware of uh, the need to conserve migratory species and wetlands. And that is where public engagement and a lot of awareness building comes into the picture. Um, um, this is one area that many of us are trying to work on in Asia to get people to be more aware about migratory birds uh, and forms a really large part of the work that I do day to day. And of course, now that I've talked about science, local engagement, policy gaps and community engagement, uh, we cannot forget that for migratory bird conservation to be successful, for it to deliver what it offers to deliver, there needs to be very strong cooperation between stakeholders at the regional and international level. So transboundary cooperation is absolutely necessary for um, migratory bird conservation to happen effectively. Um, I'm not going to talk that much about transboundary conservation, but just to uh, provide a little bit of background on transboundary conservation. Um, we know very well that ecosystems around the region and around the world are broken up by political boundaries, um, national boundaries, subnational boundaries, and different um, entities at the national level are obviously subjected to different legislation. So um, to address these challenges um, at the international and the regional level that also bring together and considers the connectivity uh, of migratory bird species using different landscapes, uh, we need to get different actors and stakeholders across different subnational and national entities to work together to ensure that the kinds of actions that we do for migratory bird conservation is well coordinated and harmonized at the continental scale. Um, this could happen at obviously many different levels. We could uh, we could um, drive transboundary cooperation at the at the multilateral level, and obviously many frameworks are out there for us to work at and collaborate at the multilateral level. This could happen through the frameworks of, for example, the Ramsar Convention that many of you are probably familiar with and the Convention of Migratory Species, which brings together more than 120 countries. But there are also other means for countries to work together through bilateral cooperation. And uh, for those of you who are working in the policy space, you are probably well aware that there are many of these bilateral instruments out there where um, countries are working together um, 
at the bilateral level to look into the needs of migratory bird conservation. Uh, Australia, for example, is involved in many of these bilateral instruments uh, with countries in Asia, for example, um, and there are existing agreements between the Australian government together with the Korean government and the Japanese government to collaborate and cooperate on um, species that are of shared interest to both countries. So um, there are lots of scope for countries to work together at the bilateral level. Um, I know I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, I just ran through this very briefly uh, on all these different multilateral instruments out there for us to work together on. Um, the CMS is obviously a very well-known instrument and of course the Convention on Wetlands. Uh, I'm sorry I mess, mess up these slides, but um, just to make sure that uh, we are all in order here. And of course, uh, we cannot forget another very important instrument at the international level. Um, the World Heritage Convention is a very powerful instrument for us to get people to work together at the in international level. Um, although very much uh, um, the World Heritage Convention or some of us could refer to as UNESCO um, have been involved in the protection of cultural heritage. Uh, I think in recent years, there have been some really good examples to show how UNESCO uh, has taken action and can be mobilized to protect important areas of wetlands at the national and at the regional scale. I think one of the best examples uh, of how UNESCO have come forward to support and enhance the protection of wetlands and migratory species has happened recent years in the Yellow Sea region. Um, the Yellow Sea, as I mentioned earlier on, is obviously a very important uh, part of Asia for the conservation of migratory species by virtue of its geography and the species that use it. Um, and of course, it connects the jurisdictions of three countries, uh, North Korea, South Korea, and the People's Republic of China. But this uh, this part of the flyway sits around some of the most densely populated parts of the planet. So uh, a lot of cooperation and coordination is needed to ensure that the wetlands that are shared across these three countries are well protected. Uh, there are many instruments uh, out there for us to uh, get people to work together on protecting ecosystems and wetlands, in particular in the Yellow Sea. And I hope that this slide shows you one of uh, uh, examples of some of these instruments out there that people have access to to protect uh, wetlands and migratory birds in the Yellow Sea. Um, in recent years, uh, those of us in the policy space have worked very closely with the governments of Korea and China, um, and of course very closely with the IUCN and UNESCO to push for the recognition of these um, wetlands in the Yellow Sea. And I think uh, this was uh, uh, concluded to great success in the last three years. Uh, some of you who have been following developments in the Yellow Sea will remember that just about one or two years ago, um, some of the most important wetlands on the coast of South Korea were inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And that happened uh, one or two years after the inscription of two key Chinese wetlands that are recognized to be globally important for migratory species. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is really that uh, uh, international collaboration is very important for the conservation of migratory species. The Yellow Sea is one of the key stages for international cooperation to come together and to uh, mobilize resources at a, at a very large scale to ensure that some of these high priority areas of wetlands um, are protected. And, and fortunately, the, moment, uh, the momentum and resources that is invested into this is beginning to um, show um, signs of success through the inscription of some of these important areas of wetlands for um, migratory bird conservation. Um, I would like to spend the next couple of minutes also talking a little bit about the work that we do in, in, in BirdLife International to protect migratory species. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our work, uh, we work on many different um, issues in bird conservation at the programmatic level. Uh, there are existing programs we have here in BirdLife looking at climate change, at forest conservation, at site and habitat conservation, and of course, uh, for the work that I do um, on migratory species and flyway conservation. Um, the flyway conservation work that we do at BirdLife International is organized at the regional level, at the scale of the flyway, um, and we try our best to uh, work to coordinate uh, the different stakeholders that are active on wetlands and migratory bird conservation across um, the flyway. Um, our work is very much focused at site-based interventions at some of these priority sites in the flyway, uh, but we also work very um, 
more, we also work more broadly trying to address the, uh, the broad issues affecting micro birds like um, bird hunting and habitat protection. And of course, against this backdrop, we work very closely to build the capacity of local people um, for migratory bird conservation. Uh, we work closely with different stakeholders and actors to, to basically strengthen that collaboration between all these different players. And we are very much um, interested in driving forward a lot of the work on policy and, and research on migratory bird science. Um, our work in the East, East Asian fly, uh, Australian Flyway happens across many countries. Um, some of these are NGOs that you know, and these are bird life partners. These are partners that we work through um, to work on the ground to protect key areas. So uh, currently we are active at more than 10 countries across the flyway, um, working on many of these different priorities that I mentioned earlier on. Um, I'll just go through with you uh, some of these examples of what we have done on the ground in recent years um, at some of these um, important flyway landscapes in Asia. Uh, one of the pieces of work that I'm really excited to share is the work that we've done in Thailand, for example. Uh, many of you who know Thailand would know that Thailand is a very important country for migratory bird conservation, uh, especially as a, as a key wintering area for uh, important populations of shorebirds in the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Um, if you look at the signs, very important populations of um, two very charismatic species, the spoonbill sandpiper and the Nordman's green shank, are concentrated here in Thailand. So getting uh, conservation right in Thailand is very important for us um, here at BirdLife International. Uh, one of the key um, areas of work that we have advanced in recent years uh, is the acquisition uh, of an area of coastal wetland in the inner Gulf of Thailand. Um, and this is through the work of our bird life partner in Thailand through the Bird Conservation of Society of Thailand. Um, we were able to work with our partner in Thailand to acquire area uh, wetlands um, that are now under um, private management. Um, this is a very important area of wetland, but I must also say that this area of wetland is important to local people's livelihood. Um, in Thailand, salt farming is a big part of um, the livelihoods of coastal communities. And here in the inner Gulf of Thailand, we work very closely with our, our partner in Thailand to engage um, salt farmers to play a role in driving the conservation of migratory shorebirds. Um, this area is also a very popular um, site for bird watchers um, is visited by lots of tourists nationally and internationally and uh, we have worked closely with our partner to ensure that the infrastructure to cater to ecotourists are out there for them to use. So um, Thailand is a very important part of the work that we do for migratory species conservation here in, in bird life. Uh, right across the border in Cambodia, uh, we have a very different focus and priority. Uh, in Cambodia, we work very much with uh, local communities to advance sustainable agriculture, uh, to protect migratory shorebirds and a really charismatic species of uh, waterbird in Cambodia, the Saros crane, which we can also find here in Australia, in the northern parts of Queensland. Uh, the Saros crane, unfortunately, are not doing that well here in Southeast Asia. Uh, we've got one or two populations and all populations of Saros crane in our region are in steep decline. So the Saros crane has become one of the priority species that we are working hard on the ground to try to, to, to save. Um, in two or three of these wetlands in Cambodia, we have worked a lot with local communities to develop um, an innovative scheme for farmers to grow rice sustainably um, and using very low levels of uh, pesticides and, and um, fertilizers. And this hopefully would be beneficial to Saros crane conservation in the longer term. Um, the same landscapes that are being used by the Saros cranes are also used by large congregations of uh, godwits an annually. So the work to protect the Saros cranes are also able to pr uh, help many other migratory species such as godwits and a whole suite of other sandpipers and plovers. Uh, in Korea, uh, we have uh, uh, a very interesting project that has um, taken place over many years, um, con concluding it just before the pandemic. For those of you who are familiar with the Korean part of the Yellow Sea, uh, we know that the Korean coastline is very intensively used um, by aquaculture and agriculture. There are very little um, land uh, that's out there that, that migratory species can use. Um, and at one of these really important coastal wetlands we have here in South Korea uh, called the Gum River Estuary. Um, this is one of the most important sites for staging migratory species 
not just in Korea, but more broadly across the East Asian Australasian flyway. Uh, unfortunately, due to the intensive land use along the Korean coastline, there are very few areas where migratory birds can roost at high tide. And uh, one of these interesting initiatives that have been set up by um, our partner in Australia, BirdLife Australia, was to work with the local government to explore the construction of some of these artificial uh, floating roofs. Um, they have been experimented and trialed about two or three years ago, and I think they have all shown really good success um, based on what monitoring data that BirdLife Australian colleagues have compiled. Uh, we can see that uh, large congregations of these migratory species, including the threatened Far Eastern Curlew, are using these uh, floating roofs uh, on the coastline of, of South Korea. So um, this is a really interesting project and uh, there's, uh, there's scope for scaling up to different parts of the Korean coastline where high tide roosting areas are um, in big demand for migratory shorebird species. And of course, uh, we also very much engage on some of the work that we are trying to do for priority species such as the spoonbill sandpiper. Um, the spoonbill sandpiper, um, as I've mentioned several times in my presentation, is one of the most threatened species we have here in the East Asian Australian flyway. Uh, recent estimates of its population show that the birds have declined precipitously in the last um, 10 years and the latest estimate shows that there are probably less than 500 individuals of this shorebird alive right now. So it's definitely one of the most threatened migratory species we have here in the flyway. So BirdLife is currently working with many of these um, NGOs on the ground um, to drive the conservation of key areas of coastal wetlands for the spoonbill sandpiper. Um, and we know that uh, securing some of these breeding grounds in northeastern Siberia in Russia is really going to be critical for the conservation of the spoonbill sandpiper in the next few years. So um, starting in early 2010s, uh, BirdLife International worked very closely with Russian researchers, the RSPB, um, and other conservationists to to establish a, what uh, we would call a hit starting program um, in these um, windswept tundra landscapes in Russia. Uh, basically, the work here is to help the birds get a head start in their lives. Uh, we know that spoonbill sandpipers suffer from high mortalities from natural pred predation. And uh, through the head starting program that has been implemented in northeastern Russia, um, the, the goal is really to um, ensure that a larger uh, larger proportion of the birds hatch each season will survive to adulthood. So I think uh, this program has been well in place for the last 10 years or so. Um, and I think thanks to the work um, in large part, thanks to the head starting work that has been done in Russia, uh, it seems that uh, the decline that uh, is being faced by the spoonbill sandpiper has began to slow down a little bit in, in the last few years. Uh, this is of course a difficult project to, to implement because it involves so many players and it happens at such a remote part of the world. But uh, it will remain our priority and we hope to continue working with um, NGOs and especially the East Asian Australasian Fly Partnership to ensure that this work uh, continues for the Spoonbill Sandpiper. So um, uh, the few examples that I've been able to mention uh, hopefully give you a, a bit of a flavor of the different work, uh, kinds of projects that we are doing on the ground to protect migratory species um, in their breeding grounds, in their wintering grounds, and in their staging grounds. But there's also a lot of work that we are doing at the regional level to get governments to work together. And one of the most exciting initiatives that I've been able to work on in recent years is what we call the um, regional Flyway Initiative. Uh, this is an initiative that is supported by the Asian Development Bank, um, a very major financing institution in, based in the Philippines. Uh, many of you working in conservation financing may well have heard about the ADB and its work in the Asia Pacific region. Um, in recent years, we have been in a lot of these engagements uh, with ADB, and I think ADB has developed a strong interest in wanting to mobilize large-scale financing to protect critical areas or wetlands for migratory birds across their flyways. So um, in 2021, um, working closely with BirdLife International in the, and the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, uh, we set up a new project to look at what are the opportunities out there for protection and which can hopefully benefit from the large scale financing that ADB can bring to the table for governments in this flyway. Uh, we are currently starting with 10 countries and in the last few uh, months or so, I've been working closely with uh, our colleagues at the EFP and at the ADB 
to basically identify priority landscapes across the flyway for uh, potential financing under this initiative. Um, we've looked through a lot of the signs that has been uh, out there for many of these countries in the East Asian Australian flyway to identify these priority landscapes. And hopefully um, in the next few months, we, are, we will be able to um, put, to, put together what available information we have on these landscapes into investment concept proposals for the ADB to consider, uh, while at the same time reaching out and engaging the governments of these 10 countries to get them interested um, in uh, the financing that is possible for mobilization at the national level to protect these wetlands and of course the, the migratory species that they, they, they harbor. So um, with this slide, I think this brings me to my, my final, um, uh, final uh, presentation slide. I hope my presentation has given um, you all um, an understanding of some of the challenges that we face with migratory bird conservation in Asia, um, but also at the same time, some of the opportunities that are emerging um, through the kinds of mechanisms and initiatives out there in and around the region. Um, there's a lot of work obviously that needs to be done in the, in the next few years, um, but I think there's a lot of good momentum coming from researchers like you um, and also policymakers at the national and international level. And we are uh, very hopeful that through initiatives such as the RFI that I've just mentioned about and also other in-country or site level work that has been um, pursued by our national partners and other NGOs, we will be able to make a, a bigger difference for migratory birds in this flyway. Um, thank you once again for having me on today's session. And um, I'm very happy to take some of your questions on migratory bird conservation and also some of the projects that we're doing in Asia. Thanks.